Um, kia ora, I'm Nat. I'm a master's student at the University of Auckland working with Campbell Jones. Um, and my thesis is looking at the living wage campaign at the University of Auckland. Um, and I'm kind of concerned with this like, big theme around possibility. Um, so a social ontology of impossibility and how the way we think about ideas and social change can kind of affect the way we, um, I guess, dilute our politics uh, in, in trying to reduce ourselves to these appearances and horizons of possibility. Um, so I wanted to sort of premise it with my main points because I think that in my actual paper they seem a little abstract. So um, the title of my paper is The Reduction of Politics to Ethics, The Living Wage and the Struggle to Determine Social Necessity. So my point with social necessity is that in political economy this is this kind of abstract category. We say like we must pay the worker the socially necessary means of subsistence but that doesn't actually contain something and I'm looking at the living wage in one way as um, trying to fill that, that definition of what is socially necessary, you know. So this could be this new minimum where we can test it and we say this is socially necessary. Um, but I also want to kind of tear the living wage apart a bit too because as um, supportive of it, as I am of it, because it's entirely necessary and um, achievable, I think that it's kind of undermining itself uh, in terms of its approach a bit. So that's my kind of caveat. Also, apologies that um, I'm kind of tacked on the end of like discussion of food and stuff. I guess you can think about um, the living wage uh, allows you to buy food. <laughs> but um, here we go. Back into the theory. Um, so central to any discussion of social movements is how political positions frame themselves in relation to what is perceived as realistically possible. The horizon of what is determined to be possible or impossible is often defined by the prevailing social reality established in the logic of the dominant. The tactic of disqualifying speech which situates itself outside of the common conception of intelligibility manifests itself in the claim that reality structurally precludes the possibilities put, uh, for change put forward by those who oppose systems of inequality as preventable and unnecessary. This method of disqualifying dissential speech is fundamental to Jacques Rancière's work on the possibility of politics. The living wage campaign is illustrative of how abstractions relating to necessity, particularly economic necessity, come to be defined by the obfuscated material struggles which seek to determine the content of these abstract categories. The living wage arguably seeks to contest and reconfigure the content of the socially necessary means of subsistence as it appears in the wage form. Thus, the apparent necessities which maintain a particular construction of social and economic reality are open to contestation. The living wage campaign will be explored in its contradictory position, both in contesting possibilities for wage labour and the performative negation of this position in its adopted strategies. This is characteristic of what can be thought of as a double bind in, uh, found in the work of Jacques Derrida on the undecidability at the root of any ethical act and is a frequent dilemma faced in activist politics. In the attempt to achieve a particular goal, there's always a tension, a pulling in two directions where one must necessarily confront the conflict, usually framed as reform or revolution. I'm sure people who are involved in activism have had a lot of meetings about this. Uh, in other words, the tension in either conceding to the most immediate forms of engagement with an issue or entirely rejecting these terms as established within existing hierarchies and forms of exclusion. Um, so I guess a bit of explanation of the living wage. The campaign calls for a market wage set to shifting levels of income necessary to provide workers and their families with the basic necessities, necessities of life and distinguishing it from current minimum wage and poverty thresholds enable workers to live with dignity and to participate as active citizens in society. A market wage is emphasised to indicate that any benefits would be accessed through participating in the labour market as opposed to a form of state redistribution. The proposal defines wage levels as an entitlement for workers to acquire a moderate and sustainable standard of living, irrespective of the particular form of work they carry out. This rejects economic logics of wages defined by a market mechanism based on the value, effort or skill involved in a given form of work. Um, so now on to criticising it. Empirically calculating the cost of basic necessities 
lends itself to a logic which prioritises consumption and focuses the nexus of wage-related injustice at the level of worker as excluded consumer rather than exploited producer. The extent to which this stated purpose is undermined by the emphasis on voluntary implementation and appeals to business ethics will be discussed shortly. For now, it need only be stated that the notion of one's right to sustainable wages and levels of disposable income which enable active participation in society is advanced by this campaign. In political economy, the indeterminate category of socially necessary is an indication of the contingent and dialectical nature of social relations, constantly in tension and movement. The determinate content of what comes to be defined as socially necessary in any given situation is not a fixed set of parameters, but in fact in a constant state of becoming as a result of the labour-capital relation. This is derivative of a more general characteristic of capitalism, in which it cannot be defined as a fixed system of objects, but is in fact manifest within the constant antagonism between labour and capital. The key point is to consider the presupposition of political procedures which establish the material grounding of these abstractions prior to them appearing as fixed theoretical categories in political economic discourse. Beginning with Adam Smith, it has remained a constant assumption in positing the natural price of labour, or the exchange value of labour power for the Marxists, as uh, necessarily contingent upon the cost presented to the worker in reproducing themselves and their families. The primary determination of wages is based on the absolute <coughs> minimum necessary to reproduce both the worker and regenerate the working class in subsequent generations. The actual content of the means of subsistence, however, is the socially agreed upon minimum. Factors which may contribute to a socially defined minimum include governmental intervention and in market procedures, such as legislated minimum wage, uh, or culturally and socially determined standards of living contested in civil society. In this distinction between an apparent fixed category of the means of subsistence and its socially contested determination, the possibility of a living wage can be framed as establishing a new socially necessary minimum wage for uh, wage labour. Sorry, socially necessary minimum. The political motivation to challenge wage-based exploitation is often to identify the social processes at work in appropriating <coughs> the value of labour's product. Marx's fundamental discovery, which revolutionised bourgeois political economy, was to identify the source of value as the product of labour and how surplus value as a portion of unpaid labour time is transformed into profit. While labour as a source of value is present in the work of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, they additionally work through a series of arguments which attempt to justify labour's exclusion from its product, thereby distinguishing their approach to the problem of value from that of Marx. Surplus value explains a particular relation in the labour process that illustrates how value is first produced and subsequently appropriated. It indicates the process whereby labour is denied the entitlement to its full product because of this disjunction between the exchange value of labour, the cost to reproduce the worker, and its use value, the ability for labour to produce value beyond that necessary to reproduce itself. So in Marx's terms, this relation is described when the worker objectifies more labour time in his product than is objectified in the product that keeps him in existence as a worker. Uh, it is this kind of productive labour that is the basis for the ex existence of capital. So capital is only capital insofar as this portion of objectified labour which sets living labour to work in order to appropriate additional surplus value. This is the self-valorizing nature of capital. The political injunction derived from exposing this dynamic in capital relations is to assert workers' entitlement to the produce of their labour based on the possibility of overcoming labour's subordination to capital. The living wage proposal, however, sidesteps this conception of wage labour and capital appropriation and instead frames the need to increase wages as an ethical injunction at the symptomatic level of capitalist relations. The proposal states that the living wage is not mandatory but aspirational. It calls on our business ethics and the reasonable expectation that employment will enable families to meet their basic needs and to be able to participate minimally in society. The language of business ethics and the possibility of ethical consumption based on the accreditation approach of living wage employers illustrates the way this campaign is embedded within existing horizons of realistic or reasonable possibilities which maintain structural systems of domination. Business, ethic, business ethics indicates an interesting shift in the interaction between <coughs> the corporate world and the social common. From the vampiric entities described by Marx to the pathological <coughs> externalizing, externalizing machines described by Joel Bacan, these vehicles of capital illustrate a violent history of expropriation and exploitation, division and displacement. One of the ways in which ethics has been sold to businesses is in the framing of these issues as compatible with profit-driven agendas. We can see this at work with ideas that a well-paid worker is a productive worker. <coughs>
which indicates how the initiative sells itself to the employer as an ethics palatable to the realities and demands of the business world. Campbell Jones takes up a reading of Derrida in order to interrogate the limits, tensions and undecidability at the core of the possibility of business ethics. While this discussion critiques a calculative approach towards business ethics, which negates the grounding of an ethical act and transforms it into a form of self-interest, thereby producing another form of economic calculation and outside of the definition of what could be considered ethics. It maintains the importance of the undecidability of ethics in which it cannot be reduced to consensus or a technology for reducing undecidability. What we can take from this is that business ethics is on the one hand positive because it raises these questions and represents the possibility of addressing uh, issues of social justice. However, on the other hand, negative, as it also represents the possibility of reproducing sources of injustice and situating it under the power of management. The reduction of politics into ethics can be described in the language of Rancière and his distinction between politics and police. The police order is a distribution of the sensible, which inscribes a particular mode of perception onto the social. Essentially, the police order is a phenomenological organisation of the social, uh, which serves to order social roles or parts. The police order presupposes a distribution of what is visible and what not, of what can be heard and what cannot. In contrast to this containment of the social, politics is defined as an intervention in the visible and sayable. In relation to the living wage campaign, a performance of politics in the Ronciarian sense would entail an intervention in the distribution of immediately perceptible possibilities for wage labour. This would reject the disqualification of alternatives to current conditions of wage labour which decry the practical consequences of instituting a mandatory living wage as unrealistic, unaffordable and unnecessary. In conceding the position of wage labour to the dominant distribution of the sensible in terms of economic practicality, the living wage campaign engages with the problem at the level of consensus. With consensus, we have the dissolution of politics into police, whereby what could have been an intervention instead inscribes itself in the existing distribution of possibility, thus sacrificing the possibility of radical social change. An interesting element of how consensus works in these political struggles is that disagreement disappears. We can all agree, management and workers, that the living wage is a good idea. However, a series of practicalities bind the hands of those in power, making them powerless to these ostensibly reasonable proposals for change. The campaign is positioned on the terms and territory of the employer, as opposed to and potentially at the expense of the worker. It states, the living wage enables an employer to know that what he, she pays a worker is sufficient for them to live modestly and participate in society. It has proved very attractive to many employers and studies show it pays off in terms of morale and productivity. The issue that arises from this form of engagement is that given existing systems of inequality in society, attempting to institute changes on a voluntary basis reinscribes these hierarchies in the appearance of a new system. As long as the living wage makes appeals to moral force and business ethics, it limits itself to horizons of possibility grounded in the logic of economic dominance and inequality. In order to exceed this limitation, it is vital to engage with the problem of wage labour on the terms of the worker and to interrogate the social processes which constitute and maintain exploitative working conditions. In the realm of consensual ethics, there are no enemies. But perhaps the rallying point of a politics for social change today is to declare an enemy. In this declaration, we invoke the need to make a decision, to take a side and to name the enemy which reproduces conditions of inequality against which we suffer and fight. If we consider wage labour from the position of the worker, it becomes clear that a living wage must demand the death of capital. How then to conceive of what to do from here? Referring back to the double bind of the situation, we cannot come up with a clear blueprint for how to act as we are necessarily pulled in apparent contradictory directions. However, we must resituate this movement and this discussion to the primacy of the workers themselves. The point is not that we need to sacrifice the immediate material needs of some today in order to facilitate the conditions of the coming revolution for all tomorrow. The issue with the living wage campaign as it currently stands is that as a form of political speech, it speaks to employers, it addresses their demands and interests, and it marginalises the voice of the worker under the guise of ethics. This raises the question of how this campaign would be altered if, if it addressed the voice of workers in making a demand, and subsequently how notions of possibility for material change may be shifted in this move. If the workers demand a living wage, grounded in their rejection of exploitation, demand what is currently impossible in our ethical horizon of realistic possibilities, the power dynamics of this situation are fundamentally reconstituted.
Rotsier's extensive analysis of the role of speech in politics outlines how those in positions of minority or marginality can demonstrate their capacity of equal intelligence, their capacity to reason on equal footing to those currently in positions of power. This position is not grounded in an ethics of voluntary self-interest, but an obligation in the workers' demonstration of equality to hear them as equal and legitimate members of the, con of the conversation. Rotsier reminds us that unless we begin from here, begin from an axiomatic equality, we have already lost not only this battle, but the entire war against capital.